my least favorite word, hands down, is the N-word, which I learned to loathe growing up in Detroit's inner city, where it occasionally raised its head like a cobra. Uh, I understand what makes it unacceptable for whites, but I confess that I still don't fully understand what makes it acceptable for blacks. Now, I got this job. <laughs> How do we get non-black people to stop saying nigger and to start using the N-word? 097-211. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder. And a Jefferson County High School teacher has now received the longest suspension on record for calling a student the N-word. Paul good morning. It's nice morning, to see you. It's, it's nice to be here. Right now, as we sit here, it seems to me an informal jury of your peers yes. and your fans and your critics and your business associates yes. Yes. Are, are weighing the question, is Paul Dean a racist? So I'll ask it to you bluntly. Are you a racist? No. Yes, even in America, like when five children in an upper-class suburb in this country write the hated word nigger in code word in their school albums. Well, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, because I kept thinking to myself as I read the language in the book, um, if I use some of the terms in your circle, you'd have, it'd have been a difficult life. The word I'm thinking of is the word nigga. Yeah. That you keep kept using among yourselves, yeah. among your other uh, friends. No other word in the American vocabulary has sparked more passion, debate, vitriol, and censorship than the word nigga. It's likely that just hearing the word made you cringe a little. But one thing's for certain, non-black people would still be casually saying the word nigger if it wasn't for OJ Simpson. I'm fascinated by the way little moments can have an outsized impact on the world. The way little decisions can snowball into unstoppable avalanches of consequence. There are few greater examples of this idea in American pop culture history than the OJ Simpson trial. Almost 30 years later, we are still obsessed with the smallest details and side characters in this story. I mean, there are literally dozens of highly produced documentaries and movies about OJ's eventual acquittal. Folks are still scratching their heads in bewilderment, asking what went wrong, Wh where do we fail, how did he get away with it? I'm not particularly interested in rehashing whether or not OJ did it, mainly because I think the obsession with OJ's trial was always about more than the crime he was accused of committing. More on that in a bit. OJ has managed to stay relevant to this very day. He has nearly a million Twitter followers and videos of him doing random things ride the algorithmic wave every few months. Hey Twitter world, this is yours truly. Now coming soon to Twitter, you'll get to read all my thoughts and opinions on just about everything. Now there's a lot of fake OJ accounts out there. So this one, at the real OJ32 is the only official one. So this should be a lot of fun. I got a little getting even to do. So God bless, take care. OJ is the gift that keeps on giving, and boy has he given us a lot. We wouldn't have the Kardashians without OJ, Jay-Z's 444 album wouldn't be complete without OJ. OJ like, I'm not black, I'm OJ. Okay. And most importantly, non-black people would still be casually saying without OJ. Technically, we should thank this guy. That's Chris Darden, the black man tasked with prosecuting OJ for the 1994 murder of Nicole Simpson and Ronald Goldman. Chris Darden may be the most unlucky man in the history of American jurisprudence. The attorney for the man accused of killing rapper Nipsey Hussle is withdrawing from the case. Chris Darden, the former LA County prosecutor who was on the OJ Simpson murder trial, he noted that he and his children have received threats since he took on the case. Yeah, that, that's rough, but he should also be recognized as an unsung hero in meaningfully changing racial discourse forever. It's no secret that the OJ trial known as the trial of the century stopped being about OJ at some point in the legal proceedings. Whether intentionally or by chance, OJ's trial became a proxy for the never ending eternal debate on race in America. 63% of whites feel that OJ Simpson can get a fair trial while 61% of blacks say he cannot. Has race now taken center stage as we continue dissecting this courtroom drama? And through the course of the trial, it became explicitly about the word nigger. There's a specific moment when this happened. It was when OJ's legal team discovered that the lead detective in the case, Mark Furman, routinely used the word nigger to describe black people. And you say on your oath that you have not addressed any black person as a nigger or spoken about black people as niggers in the past 10 years, Detective Furman. That's what I'm saying, sir. 
and that there were recordings of him doing so while bragging about brutalizing black people. You try to find a bruise on a nigger? As you can imagine, doubt was immediately cast on whether or not the crime scene evidence that he discovered could be trusted. Questions swirled about whether or not he planted the now infamous glove to frame a successful black man. People wondered if the LAPD, notoriously cruel toward the black community, could even be trusted to carry out a fair assessment of the accused multi-hyphenate entertainer. OJ's defense made such a big deal out of this blockbuster revelation that the entire case became about these tapes, and by extension, the word nigger. As you can imagine, the prosecution hated this angle. But I'm so offended by those remarks, I would rather not stand at the same podium at which he stood a few moments ago. The issue here is whether this defendant killed Nicole Brown or Ron Goldman or not. The issue here isn't my ethics. The issue here isn't racism. The issue here isn't Detective Furman. This case is a circus, and they've made it a circus. The defense, led by Johnny Cochran, was seizing control of the narrative by centering one of the bloodiest words in American history. The prosecution was going to have to convince a majority black jury to trust the integrity of their star witness, Mark Furman, after hearing him commit the cardinal sin of racism and break the nigger rule of 1968. If you've never heard of that rule, that's okay, I made it up. Okay, I didn't make it up, I just made up the name, but, but it's real. The rule is simple. After the year 1968, the word nigger is to be avoided. Only permissible when quoting someone else. This rule is pretty intuitive, but Republican political strategist Lee Atwater gives it some helpful context in what are known as the Southern Strategy Tapes. Yes, I know, another set of tapes, but bear with me. This political strategy was designed to help Republicans capitalize on the racial hostility of Southern white people after the Civil Rights Movement. Here, I'll let Lee Atwater explain it himself. You start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger, that hurts your backfire, so you say stuff like uh, force busing, states' rights, and all that stuff. And you're getting so abstract now, you're talking about cutting taxes, and all of these things you're talking about are totally economic things, and the byproduct of them is blacks get hurt worse than whites. Atwater's description is the Cliff Notes version of how the word nigger became politically unsayable as an insult. And in many ways, this development was great. For nearly 400 years, the word had been used to harm, control, demean, and categorize black people as a subhuman species. And suddenly, the tide of public opinion had rendered it virtually untouchable by 1968. This is largely a testament of the incredible narrative success of the civil rights movement. Being racist in explicit terms wasn't cool anymore, and the country knew it. There are, however, a few problems still present here. One, the intentional and sinister abstraction of racism that Atwater describes. That has forever changed the identifiability of racism and has thrusted us into an era of what one author describes as racism without racists. Secondly, just because the word became politically unsayable in popular culture as an insult doesn't mean that it completely fell out of the American lexicon. For starters, I was born in the early 90s and have been called a nigger in my lifetime. Bigots still exist. Have you heard of Call of Duty? This means that the word still holds a great deal of potency as a slur to this very day. For many black people today, hearing the word is startling and angering because the dehumanizing intent is so clear. I, I called you a nigger. You're a nigger. Nasty f***ing nigger. Okay. It's mind-boggling that even after being told of the demeaning and lethal power of the word, some white people still want to use it. I don't know what to do when I hear my friends using this word in a song. I don't know what to do when it's just, it's all the time. Words don't have meaning without context, okay? When I was young and I used to go see my family uh, in, in, in Philadelphia, where my dad was from, they would all call him Billy. His name is William Paul Coates. Um, no one in Baltimore called him Billy, and had I referred to my father as Billy, that probably would have been a problem. That's because the relationship between myself and my dad is not the same as the relationship between my dad and his mother and his sisters who he grew up with. It's the same thing with words within the African American community, or within any community. Uh, my wife, with her girlfriend, will use the word bitch. I do not join in. I don't, you know, say, hey, I want to... The question one must ask is why so many white people have difficulty extending things that are basic laws, you know, of how human beings interact 
to black people. The history of the word nigger has laden it with barbs so intractable that even hearing someone use the word to quote someone else using the word is just unacceptable. And for the most part, we've all agreed to that today. Up until the mid 1990s, it was common for public figures to just blurt out the word when quoting someone else or asking a question. Whenever Douglas said nigger, the Democratic papers changed it to Negro. That's why I went back to the opposition transcripts because they didn't have those embellishments and those edits and that softening. Back to OJ's trial. Johnny Cochran's plan to introduce these nigger tapes into the trial would make the word a constant part of the courtroom discourse, which would inevitably extend to the nearly nonstop news coverage of the case and naturally embed itself into the national conversation around America. Water coolers and barber shops and dysfunctional family dinners would suddenly be littered with the word nigga. That, you know, nigga, nigga this, nigga, nigga please, nigga, you know, can you lend a nigga a pencil? I'd like to imagine that Chris Darden couldn't abide such a possibility. He later stated how much he hated the word and wouldn't allow it to be said in his own home. And so he refused to say it in the courtroom, instead creating the now ubiquitous euphemism for the word nigga, n-word. Let me set the scene. Darden is making his case to Judge Lance Ito for why these tapes shouldn't be introduced into the trial. Darden's speech, and make no mistake about it, it was a speech, is a soaring 3,370 word diatribe. All about why the majority black jury would be utterly and irreversibly prejudiced if the N-word was introduced into the courtroom. Unfortunately, not much of the actual courtroom footage from that day is on the internet. We have a short clip, the transcript, and this reenactment from the show American Crime Story. The N-word is a dirty, filthy word, Your Honor. It is so prejudicial and inflammatory that the use of it in any situation will evoke an emotional response from any African American. We're talking about a word that blinds people. And when you mention that word to this jury, it will blind them to the truth. Understandably, Johnny Cochran took exception to this description of black America. First and foremost, Your Honor, I would like to apologize to African Americans across this country. It is preposterous to say that African Americans collectively are so emotionally unstable that they cannot hear offensive words without losing their moral sense of right and wrong. They live with offensive words, offensive looks, offensive treatment every day. Darden refers to the N-word five times, never once uttering the actual word. I actually looked through the New York Times archives. There's no trace of the N-word being used in this way. In fact, they'd only printed something about an N-word once and they were referring to nuclear power. Christopher Darden gives the American people in the most closely watched trial in history an alternative and changes the course of racial dialogue forever. That is perhaps the most incredible part of the story. Not only Chris Darden's refusal, but also how willingly society adopted an alternative to a word deeply embedded into our vocabulary. Hello, friends. Um, I'm making this video to talk about the most regretful and shameful thing that I've ever had to talk about publicly. Are you a racist? No, I'm not. I'm not a racist. I never should have said what I said. It was wrong. I'm embarrassed by it. The veteran instructor was terminated recently after using the N-word in class to make a point. I don't know how it came out of my mouth. You are under oath yes, that did. you have used a word that is the most mm -hmm. offensive word you mm -hmm. can use to describe an African American. Mm -hmm. So how does someone it use was. the N-word, whether in anger or in a joke or in private, the most offensive word to African Americans and not be considered a racist? Yes. Um, the day I used that word, it was a world ago. And I tell you what, if there's anyone out there that has never said something that they wish they could take back, if you're out there, please pick up that stone and throw it so hard in my head that it kills me. Please, I want to meet you. I want to meet you. I is what I is and I'm not changing. And just like that, a single decision that snowballed into an unstoppable avalanche of consequence.
Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, why don't you give it a like and consider subscribing. I'm just getting started, so those kinds of things go a long way. I'll be making explainers and deep dives just like this one on topics of race and politics and popular culture and whatever else you want me to talk about. So put that in the comments. I'll be looking through for some really good ideas. Until next time, peace.